Hey, what's up everybody? It's Izzy from Powerlifting to Win, and in today's program review, we're going to be looking at Shaco's numbered routines. Now, for those of you who don't know, Boris Shaco is perhaps the foremost powerlifting coach in Russia today. He's worked with world record holders and champions such as Andre Bayev, Andre Milanichev, Alexei Sivakon, Yuri Fedorenko, Maximum Podtini, to name only a handful. As you might expect, on the back of this tremendous success, Shaco's programs have generated an incredible interest worldwide. So in the rest of this review, we're going to analyze the critical faults and the critical merit that underpin Shaco's numbered routines. Specifically, we're going to look at number 29, number 30, number 31, and number 32. Shaco possesses a formal education in sports science that he earned in Russia. His methods and practices are based on the extensive Eastern Bloc literature that surrounds the training of weightlifters. So make no mistake about it, Shaco has sound scientific principles backing his training methodologies. And not only that, but he's been doing this for decades, so he has the practical experience to go along with it as well. The numbered routines which have become so popular all over the internet were actually translated from Shaco's book using cheap translation tools like Google Translate and Babblefish. Essentially, there was a handful of guys on some forums that went through this Russian book, put it into a translator, and line by line reconstructed these programs. So what you basically have is this awkward, haphazard translation that's led to these really popular programs. And as you might expect, people have gotten the wrong idea. These programs taken from Shaco's book are, are named because they're example numbers. So for example, number 29, number 30, number 31, and number 32 are example number 29, number 30, number 31, and number 32 from the book. They're not sacred programs that Shaco uses on all of his trainees or anything like that. These are literally just examples that he provided from the book. And not Shaco's examples, but these are haphazardly translated weird versions of the examples from his book. The ironic thing is, is that so many people are running these Shaco number programs as copy paste cookie cutter templates. And the reality is, is that Shaco makes individual customized plans for every single one of his trainees. So when people download the spreadsheet, which I'm going to go ahead and put a link to in the description box for the Shaco numbered programs, and then they plug in their maxes and they do exactly what it says. Well, that goes against the spirit of the way that Shaco programs because he individualizes everything. With that in mind, we are going to evaluate these programs as if they are intended to be followed to the letter. Why? Well, as far as I know, most of you guys don't have access to Shaco as your coach. So if you're going to do the Shaco programs, you have no choice but to follow them to the letter. So we're going to look at 29, 30, 31, and 32, as I've already said. The reason why we're going to do that is because these four examples, which are all month-long routines, are designed to be run sequentially as a 16-week meat peaking cycle. As much as I'd love to show you guys the actual Shaco program, it's just impossible to do so in this format. Here's the thing. It consists of 48 different workouts. Every single one is different from session to session, week to week, and month to month. So I can't possibly show you the whole program here. What I can do is provide you a link to the spreadsheet for the Shaco programs. And from there, you can pop that open and take a look yourself. What you're going to notice is that the program features a three times weekly frequency. You're generally benching on all three days, you're squatting on Monday and Friday, and you're deadlifting on Wednesday. So you bench three times a week, squat twice a week, and deadlift once a week. All of the sessions are high volume. You average between 200 to 400 lifts per week above 50% of your one rep max. Okay, with that said, let's dig into the program a little bit deeper by looking at some of the key metrics of each program, 29, 30, 31, and 32. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get into some pretty serious analysis of the Shaco program metrics here in terms of overall volume, number of lifts, and whatnot. So go ahead and blast open that full screen and strap in, and let's start the analysis. 
So the 16 week cycle we are looking at is broken up into four blocks. Number 29, number 30, number 31, and number 32. Very loosely in terms of structure, I'd label the blocks as follows. Number 29 is a preparatory block with medium volume and medium intensity. Number 30 is an accumulation block with high volume and medium intensity. Number 31 is a transmutation block with medium volume to, and medium to high intensity. And number 32 is a realization slash peaking block with low volume, high intensity. Let's start off by explaining why number 29 is a preparatory block. First of all, as you can see, the first block features relatively similar volumes in all four weeks of the program. This is simply to introduce the lifter to workloads that are typical of a Shaco program. However, if you look closely, you'll notice that the lifter doesn't start performing regular work above 80% of their 1RM until week three of number 29. Again, this is because the lifter is spending those first two weeks just adjusting to the shock of Shaco's total volume. By the end of 29, you're, plan you're primed to handle the real Shaco workloads. In number 30, you'll notice there's virtually no work above 90%. However, compared to 29, you're about 50% higher in terms of the overall volume just in week one alone. To account for the fact that week one is so absolutely brutal, you'll see that week two is dialed back significantly in terms of volume and lifts above 80%. However, there's no rest for the weary as week three hits you even harder than week one. On number 30, with weeks 1 and 3 under your belt, week 4 becomes somewhat of a deload as volume is again drastically reduced. This variation in volume and intensity keeps the program manageable. Now, let's get into 31. You'll notice that 31 starts featuring semi-regular work above 90%. The chart doesn't show this fact, but it also features a great more deal work above 85% than 29 and 30. The overall volume is also markedly reduced from number 30. Why? Because number 31 is designed to start leading you towards a meat peak. As such, the intensity is cranked up just a bit and the volume is commensurately reduced. This allows for recovery from the brutal number 30 while preparing you for the heavyweights that are to come in number 32. Number 32 is a straight up peaking block. This block is pointless to run without first having done volume blocks beforehand. As you can see, total volume and overall number of lifts performed is reduced by almost 100% from 30 and 31. That said, the work above 90% is maintained. The only real training week on number 32 is week two. Week two prevents you from detraining during this month. However, weeks three and four basically engage a full deload relative to your normal Shaco workouts because you're expected to compete in the fourth week, allowing the body to super compensate from the brutal volumes done in number 30 and number 31 during number 32 is why this block can be thought of as a realization block. And there you have the basic breakdown of 29, 30, 31, and 32 on Shaco's programs. In terms of planning, the Shaco number programs are actually explicitly designed for powerlifting. So if you run them in order, they're literally designed to bring you to a peak in week 16. So this is a true competitor's plan. It's a true powerlifter's program. You're going to do a meet at the end of it. While the numbered programs aren't necessarily organized into blocks of focus on hypertrophy, strength, and speed, they are roughly organized into periods of emphasis on the squat, bench, and deadlift. This is an interesting take on periodization and it's highly effective for late stage intermediate and advanced athletes because similar to a team sports athlete who can't get bigger, stronger, and faster all at the same time, an advanced power lifter might not be able to recover from the necessary volume that it would take to improve all three lifts at the same time. So Shaco doesn't necessarily try to do that. If you look closely at the program, you'll notice that from week to week, the volume on each lift varies and it complements. The other thing is that if you look at it from block to block, there's big variances as well. So if you take a look at number 29, you'll notice that the deadlift volume is relatively high compared to the squat. It's almost a one to one ratio and you're actually benching less than you're squatting in number 29. However, in number 30, the squat and the bench volume increase by 50% and really you only increase the deadlift volume by about 10% compared to phase number 29. In 31, this disparity is further enhanced as the squat basically goes up to volume levels that are twice the deadlift. And as far as 32 goes, well, it's actually fairly balanced because that is the peaking block where you're trying to get all three lifts to peak at the same time for the upcoming meet. 
In terms of programming, the numbered Chaco programs are roughly organized into block programming. What I mean by that is that if you look at number 29, as I've said, it is a preparatory block. You do medium volume with medium intensity. Now when you move on to number 30, that is really an accumulation block. You're doing high volumes at medium intensities. Number 31 could best be thought of as a transmutation block because you're going to increase the intensity to medium high levels and volume comes down a notch back to medium. And finally with block 32 you're looking at a realization block because this one is a true peak. You're bringing the volume all the way to low levels and you crank the intensity up to true high levels. And that's how the lifter gets ready for the meet. So not only does Shaco in terms of programming offer you significant variety from session to session, and even week to week, but it's offering programmatic variety from block to block. And that makes Shaco the most advanced program that we've seen thus far. As such, the numbered Shaco programs are actually most appropriate for late stage intermediates and advanced athletes. For these populations, Shaco is going to work awesome. For novices and early intermediates, the complexity is a bit unnecessary and the progress is going to be slow moving in terms of weight increases. They can make progress faster on more simple programs. Unlike in, say, our review of Westside, there's really not a whole lot of criticisms to throw at Shaco in terms of specificity. You're going to be doing most of your volume on the competition movements. The program was explicitly designed for powerlifting. The program has you using great frequency. You're going to bench three times a week, squat twice a week, and deadlift once a week. The program is actually designed to lead you into a meet peak. And overall, it's just a true powerlifters program that is designed explicitly to improve powerlifting performance. However, that said, there are a few criticisms to levy against Shaco. Namely, the program uses relatively low average intensity. This is because the program is so high volume that there's no other way to survive it. If you look at the Shaco average intensity, it's generally under 70% for most of the lifts. And you rarely, if ever, go above 90% on Shaco. In fact, if you look at the bench, you don't go above 90% even one time until week 10 of the program. So in my opinion, in terms of specificity, the program could be marginally improved if you reduce the total volume so that you could increase the average intensity a bit, perhaps up to somewhere closer to 75 to 77%, rather than down there at around 67 to 69% where it's at now. Perhaps the biggest issue with Shaco in terms of specificity comes down to the fact that it might be a little bit too specific. In order to explain what I mean, I need to introduce to you the concept of diminishing marginal returns. Now the law of accommodation states that the more often you are exposed to an adaptive stimulus, the less the magnitude of that adaptation is going to be. So for example, if you go out in the sun for 15 minutes, the first time you're going to get pretty dark. The second time you're going to get a little bit less tan. The next time you're going to get even less tan than that. And so on and so forth until you're not really getting much of an effect at all. Well, the same thing holds true for training. So let me pull some numbers out of my butt to give you an example. So let's say the first training session that you do on the squat is the competition squat. You know that by improving the competition squat, you're probably going to get a 100% carryover to increase squatting performance. But what if you add a second competition squat workout to that week? Well now, due to the law of accommodation, maybe you only get 80% transference to your performance improvement from that second session. Well, what if you add a third competition squat session? Maybe on the third competition squat session, you only get 60% transference to performance improvement. Now, what if instead of adding a third competition squat, we added a pause squat? Of course, a pause squat is less specific than a competition squat, but it's also a new stimulus. It's something we haven't done before. So perhaps it gives us 75% transference to performance improvement, simply because it's not as specific, so it's not going to help us as much as a competition squat, but because we've already done two competition squat sessions in that week, Due to diminishing marginal returns, adding a pause squat session actually gives us more overall improvement than simply doing a third competition squat workout. As you can see, there's some pretty big flaws going with either extreme in terms of specificity. On the one hand, you have a program like Westside that's so non-specific that you avoid maximal adaptations. And on the other hand, you can get so specific that you're a victim of diminishing marginal returns. 
As with most things in lifting, the moderate's approach is probably best here. You want to take that middle road where you're using some variations, but you're still getting most of the volume from the competition movements. And in my opinion, Shaco might not have enough variations. I think it could potentially be improved with just some more variety in there. In terms of overload, Shaco is your basic progressive overload percentage based program. That is, you have to start with a known competition max and then all of your workouts are planned based as a percentage of your last competition max. And whenever you do a new competition and you set a new max, then your next program is going to be based percentages off of the new max. So you make progress through progressive overload. You gradually do heavier weights and more volume over time. Shaco does a fairly good job of managing fatigue despite the high nature volume of the program. It primarily achieves this through intelligent variation in intensity and volume, not only from session to session, and not only from week to week, but from block to block as well. So while you're occasionally hit with a super hard week, the week after is usually a bit of a deload comparatively speaking. And the same thing goes for the blocks. For example, 29 is a preparatory block, then you get hit with high volume in 30, 31 you back off the volume a little bit and in 32 you back way off so you can peak. Likewise, the overall frequency of Shaco helps limit fatigue as well. You're only doing three training sessions per week. So even though each of the sessions is high volume, you're still getting a lot of time to recover as well. However, this said, in my opinion, Shaco does feature needlessly high volume. There's going to be certain demographics that just cannot recover from this program. To give you some context, let's talk about the Texas method. The easiest block on Shaco for squatting is number 29. And in that block, you do twice the volume that you do on the Texas method. And the Texas method is known to cause recovery issues for a variety of trainees, especially Especially older ones. So if the Texas method gives some people problems, what do you think that Shaco is going to do? Here's the thing, there's an optimal dose response relationship between volume and training effect. So that is, generally speaking, the more volume that you do, the greater the training effect that you're going to get. However, it's not a linear relationship. So as volume increases linearly, the training effect that you get from that volume decreases at an increasing rate. So what you're really looking to do is maximize the difference between the two curves. You don't want to do the minimum necessary volume and you don't want to do the maximum volume that you can recover from. You want to do the amount of volume that gives you the greatest training effect per work done. Consider this chart. Okay, as I was just saying, there's a relationship here between training effect and volume. You'll notice here that volume is represented by the blue linear line, whereas the training effect that you get from that increasing volume is represented by the red arc there, which shows that the training effect increases, but at a decreasing rate as you add more volume. So what you really want to do here is shoot for maximizing the area under the curve. This is going to give you the greatest return on investment for your training time. Now you might be thinking, why don't I just go for the highest vo volume possible to get the maximum gains? I'm willing to sacrifice as much time as it takes. Well that's a commendable attitude, but the problem is you can only recover from so much. If you push towards that limit too quickly, you short circuit your long term potential. Think of it like this, what do you have to do to produce further gains when you're already adapted to high volume? You have to do super high volume. If you turn to super high volume programs too early, you have nowhere to go after that. You'll pass your peers in the short term, but by the time they work up to the same levels of volume that you're using, they'll be stronger because they've received more training effect per volume performed as they slowly up the volume over time. You have to remember that there's a large area of effectiveness in between not enough volume and too much volume. The question isn't whether or not you'll make progress. The question is whether or not you'll make optimal progress. Like most things in lifting, the moderate path probably contains the answer on this one. There's no real need for these high volume programs until you can't make gains on anything else. And likewise, these minimalist programs are too little to produce optimal rates of gains as well. So you really want to strike that balance based on your current level of training advancement. 
The single biggest and most critical issue with the Shaco numbered programs is a complete lack of respect for individual differences. Now to be fair, Shaco never intended these programs to be run as gospel cookie cutter templates. However, for those of you guys who are using the plug and play spreadsheets, there's no other way for you to do it. So this criticism is valid. But here's the thing. On Shaco, you only increase your maxes at the end of each cycle. So what happens if you get a lot stronger during the cycle? Let's say you're an early intermediate and you pick Shaco, and halfway through the cycle, your maxes are all up 30 or 40 pounds. Well, what's going to happen is that this program, which is already relatively light in terms of the intensity, remember, average intensity is below 70%. Well, now your average intensity is going to be shifted even further down, probably closer to 60%. And needless to say, this is just not optimal. For powerlifters, we need to be working in higher percentage ranges. So because there's no auto regulation of the training loads, Shaco is going to be suboptimal in terms of the weights that you're handling each workout. Even more importantly, on a program that's as high volume as Shaco, there is absolutely no auto regulation of the volume whatsoever. Everybody does the same amount of volume and it's ridiculously high. And it's just going to bury a lot of people. Look, even the same person, as I've said a hundred times in the programming series reviews, is going to need different volumes based on the different conditions they're facing that day. If they're underslept, they need less volume. If they're overslept, they can do more. If they're under eating, they need less volume. If they're overeating, they can do more. And you guys can come up with your own examples. But the bottom line is that in terms of volume, you need to account for individual differences in order to optimize the training stimulus that you're getting on any given training session. Again, I know Shaco writes his own customized, individualized plans for each of his athletes, but if you're going to be running the numbered programs as cookie cutter templates, this is a completely valid criticism. Shaco rates very poorly on individual differences. Here's some final thoughts for you guys. I think that Shaco is probably the best cookie cutter program that a power lifter can run, given that they are an intermediate or advanced trainee. However, cookie cutter is still cookie cutter, and in my opinion, there's no such thing as an optimal cookie cutter program. You can always make the program better through individualization, customization, and auto-regulation. And the numbered Shaco spreadsheet programs feature none of that. Again, Shaco is not a bad way to go at all. It's a great program. If you stall on the numbered programs, you can always move to the master and sport programs, or you can contact Shaco directly and have him write programming for you. He's available for that service now. That all said, Shaco, in my opinion, is just suboptimal. It's a little bit too low on the average intensity. I think the volume is too high for many populations. There's a slight overall lack of variety in the movement selection. And most importantly, there's no auto-regulation whatsoever. I must emphasize that I personally don't believe it's possible for an intermediate or advanced program to be optimal without a large degree of auto-regulation present in the program. So, as a final recommendation, I would say that Shaco was a great choice for you if you're an intermediate or advanced athlete, but I do believe there's better things out there for you. Next up in our list of programs to review is going to be the Smolov Squat Cycle. Now this program is absolutely brutal. Due to both its extreme nature and the extreme gains that it can tend to produce, this program has become extremely popular among masochistic internet lifters. So in the next review we're going to dig deep down into whether or not this program has utility for power lifters of various different classifications. So if you're interested in small up, be sure to come back to check that out. If you guys found this content interesting, informative, or entertaining, please like, share, subscribe, and send it out into the interwebs for me. If you have any questions or comments whatsoever, feel free to head over to the powerliftingtowin.com forums and I will address any issues that you have personally. Subscribe if you haven't already, and don't forget to check out powerliftingtowin.com for more great powerlifting information. Have a nice day.